Welcome to another episode of Tank Talks, your personal think tank for all things startups and venture capital. I'm your host, Matt Cohen, founder and managing partner at Ripple Ventures. On today's show, we welcome back for the second time our good friend, Devin Wright, this time as co-founder and CEO of his new ag tech startup, Lumo, to discuss how startups can help solve the climate crisis. Devin shares his amazing story of how he became aware of the water and climate crisis after moving from the Bay Area out to a seven acre ranch before the start of the pandemic in 2019, and how he quickly ran out of water in his first year. We dig into Devin's journey learning about the agriculture and irrigation industry as a total newbie, and how he realized the way farmers and growers were managing their water resources hadn't changed in generations. Devin explains how he ended up co-founding his second startup and the lessons he took from his first company, Turnstile, and applied it to building Lumo from day one. Finally, Devin explains his vision for Lumo and how he hopes to help solve the water crisis in California and eventually the rest of North America with his newest startup. But before we get started today, as our listeners probably know by now, the team at Ripple is always focused on helping our founders and portfolio companies find the best partners to work with. And when it comes to corporate finance and cash management, there's nobody we recommend more than the team at Jeeves. At Ripple, we manage all our fund expenses and employee credit cards using Jeeves. The team at Jeeves helped me get my team set up with physical and virtual cards in days. I was able to allow my teammates to expense items in multiple currencies, allowing them to pay for anything, anywhere, at any time. We weren't asked for any personal guarantees or to pay any setup or monthly SaaS fees. Not only does Jeeves save us time, but they also give us up to 3% cash back on our purchases, including expenses like Google, Facebook, or AWS every month. The best part is Jeeves puts up the cash and you settle once every 30 days in any currency you want, unlike some other corporate card companies that make you prepay every month. Listeners of Tank Talks can get set up today with a demo of Jeeves and take advantage of our Tank Talks special with a $250 signup bonus and skip the waitlist that already has thousands of companies waiting on it by visiting tryjeeves.com backslash Tank Talks. Use referral code Tank Talks to get set up today. Now let's jump into the tank for this week's episode with Devin Wright, co-founder and CEO of Lumo. Thanks for joining us in the tank today, Devin. Oh, it's my pleasure. Second time around, man. Thanks for having me. No, Devo, you know, welcome back to the tank for round two. As a guest on the show last time, we talked about bootstrapping as a startup and the lessons you learned during your time as a founder running the startup gauntlet at Turnstile. You know, but since our audience is probably 100x since the last time you were on the show, why don't you give our audience a brief background on how you initially got started working in startups and tech and the journey you've been on today? Yeah, good question. I mean, I guess my my whole life I've been kind of entrepreneurial always that kid trying to create some new little fandangled thing that I could sell to the class, whether it was uh, stink bombs or drilling holes in loonies so that I could like hack the, the uh, vending machines and sell those loonies for $5. I was always out there scheming, right? And uh, I ended up going to business school. I went to a, a school called uh, Richard Ivy School of Business. And uh, that definitely like kind of fostered and, and honed my business instinct and business uh, interest. And uh, once I graduated there, I, I tried to do a couple years of banking. I uh, had a great time, but found out it wasn't for me. And that's actually where I met you. So I have to thank the banking community because I think you were at RBC at the time, right? I was at TD. And uh, I was uh, I was also DJing at the time and uh, and, and in a band and, and was really like excited by the the opportunity of of, of, mar- of marketing for our band and thinking about the tools available to us to try to connect with and reach out to our audience not that it was ever very big but you know you're trying to foster your audience you're trying to grow it you're trying to connect with people and, and, and keep bringing them back to shows and yeah i was you know working at the bank uh, during the day but I, at night i was doing these shows and thinking like wow there really aren't a lot of tools out there for you know bands and and maybe even the small businesses the small restaurants and venues that we were playing at to connect with their audience. So uh, I dusted off my entrepreneurial curiosity and, and entrepreneurial instinct and figured, hell, you know what? I'm going to try to build uh, a solution that would have let me and my band connect with uh, with our fans. And uh, lo and behold, uh, me and my band mate, as well as another friend of ours, Chris Gilpin, um, I, he was the, the technical brains behind it all. We, we got to work and ended up building a company called Turnstile. It, it, uh, it morphed a lot from the days of our early kind of band experiments into more of like a local um, business marketing platform. But it really kind of grew and grew and over about five years, ended up building Turnstile into one of the largest Wi-Fi marketing platforms uh, out there and we're able to, to successfully sell that to, uh, to Yelp in 2017. And so, um, 
definitely a lot of luck in that story I just told you to have kind of our first startup, uh, which you were the first investor in, if I you know remember correctly. Uh, a lot of luck to have have that first startup uh, turn into something, but uh, definitely that was what got me started. And then you know the success of it just really made me know like I'm always going to be trying to uh, to build to build tech businesses. It, it was the best journey of my life. I loved doing it. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing it again. Doing it again here with, with this new company. You keep saying the word luck, Devin, and I think it was you who told me you actually don't really believe in luck. You believe in creating good opportunities that are a factor of like how luck lucky you are to see that opportunity. But to seize on that opportunity is not because of luck. I mean, luck comes around every day sometimes, but really it's about how to take that opportunity and to turn it and make it into something, which I think uh, I think you did quite well, wouldn't you say? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we could have a whole nother, I don't know where you want this podcast to go. We could have a whole nother <laughs> discussion about that, right? Like, uh, you know, how, how much the uh, outside world is just happening and you're kind of, you know, falling into it. I guess the, the view of like fate being a dominant uh, player in your life versus the view of like you manifest your opportunities by having a positive attitude and, uh, and, and, and really like, um, you know, training yourself to be, to be focused on an outcome and working toward it. And, and like, yeah, you, you actually manifest some of those outcomes. I like to, I want to believe the latter, you know, like certainly as an entrepreneur, you constantly feel at the whims of like large market forces and large, uh, outside investors and others that, you know, can make or break you. It, it uh, I think if you, if you have the mindset of like, yeah, the fates are the only thing dominating your outcomes, you can feel pretty depressed or, or uh, afraid at times. So I like to believe like, yeah, we do, we, we do, we do, man, we did manifest some really great outcomes there by just really working hard and focusing on, as you say, seizing those opportunities. Yeah. And we'll take that onto another podcast for the third time around. But, you know, one of the things that I was always impressed with, you know, by you and, and obviously in your entire career journey in technology was you were really a non-technical founder the whole way through and you had to overcome a lot of challenges. And so, you know, maybe share with our audience some of the biggest challenges that you had to overcome as a non-technical founder in order to properly lead a tech company as a CEO that you still lean on every day. You know, I'd say the the one the one biggest challenge. Well, the biggest challenge is setting up a friggin' development environment when you have no idea how to code and you realize like no one's gonna help you. You better figure out how to code yourself. I still run into that problem. But yeah, basically, like I am not technical. I still am not. Um, far more of like the go to market guy, the strategy guy. I love to tell stories and build teams and raise money. Those are the things I love to do. Um, so I always do have to find a technical partner. The biggest challenge in that I think is. You're not going to attract a partner very quickly if all you have is is just an idea, unless you can really find that person who sees the world the same as you and already has the same idea and um, you know wants to come build your idea for you. I always found that if you really want to sell a technical person, you kind of have to take your first crack at it. And I I say it um, the way I kind of what I mean by that is you have to try to build your first prototype and it's going to suck and you can't be afraid that it's going to suck and you can't be afraid that it isn't going to be scalable. But if you have a technical idea and you're non-technical, get online, learn, do the research, um, you know, on stack overflow, do the research to see if other people have tried to build a prototype of what you're talking about and go friggin' build it, uh, and do it in, in your, in your nights and weekends and do it until you find that there's something good enough to show a potential technical uh, co-founder that they can then understand where you're trying to go with things. And then they can say, okay, I see what you want. This friggin' sucks. I'm throwing it away. I'll build something 10 X better than this. And I'll join you as a partner. And and they, first off, it's like when you go to a foreign country and, and um, you know, you, you, you're trying to like meet the locals, like you don't go in speaking English, hope they just like want to learn your language. You, you have to try to speak Spanish to get a Spaniard to be like, all right, look, I can, I see you're trying, let me help you out. I'll, I can meet you in the middle here and I can help coach you. And, and then I can, you know, do some of the hard lifting as we navigate the city together. Like that's really what I think it takes, because if you're not willing to do that, not only is a technical founder going to be like, you know, what does this person know about? I'm putting a lot of risk into this basket, but I think like you want to be able to feel at least dangerous enough to understand what's being built and how, because you're going to have to assess that partner. You're going to have to um, have conversations about choices that they're making. And you don't want to leave them on an Island feeling like the person that they're working with has no way to communicate with them. So definitely the hardest thing is just like, you've got to put away your ego. Um, you have to overcome the discomfort of not, um, no, to, of knowing that you're going to build something shitty the first time you build it. But um, I encourage everyone who's non-technical trying to get into tech, like 
do the, do the work, learn how to code, learn, learn Arduino, learn whatever it is you need to do to get some basic prototype stuff started. That's really going to accelerate your ability to, I think, attract and work with a technical co-founder. I absolutely fucking love that. I remember the first time you showed me the Excel spreadsheet you had built to to show what, you know, Fangarden was really trying to do. It was probably garbage, but me being non-technical as well, I probably thought it was the coolest thing ever uh, until we actually saw real technology tell us that it was totally garbage. But you're absolutely right. I mean, think about how many, you know, starting off points that gives you when you are digging into the weeds, trying to solve your own problem, like... One, from a cultural standpoint, if you just went out and said, I'm going to start a company, but the first thing I'm going to do is raise half a million and then give it to a consulting or development firm, outsource it. You know, from a cultural standpoint, you basically are starting the company off from a full outsourcing mindset, which is completely wrong and ass backwards. And, and you had to do that yourself and learn the hard way, which is the right way. I think all founders should think about it, whether you're technical or not. It's the same as the opposite. If you are technical but you have no ability to sell or, or raise money. You still got to try and do it yourself until you can bring in a proper, you know, uh, CEO or CFO or something. Right. Oh, totally. I, you know, it's funny. I never like put my investor hat on when I answered that question and hearing you answer it reminds me of, of in the new startup we're working on Lumo. Um, uh, one of the investors who came in is a man named Sam Rosen, a wonderful water founder, uh, and CEO of a company called tap. And actually, uh, you know, when he invested and he actually led us to uh, some great introductions, like to Climate Capital, who invested, he actually said, he said outright, he's like, you know, why? He's like, I don't know exactly everything about what you're doing, uh, but the thing that's selling me is that you told me that you're not technical and you went out and you built a prototype. And he's like, I I would invest and I will make introductions, but not until you do like a five or 10 minute video clip uh, walking me through your early prototypes and showing them to me and showing me a shitty little mobile app because he's like, to me, that's culturally what I'm investing in is founders that are going to go out and solve problems on their own and, and not be afraid of uncertainty versus to your point, those that, you know, need, need all the capital to go try to outsource everything. When he shared that, I was, you know, at first I was like, man, I'm busy. I, I don't have time to go do that. But um, taking a step back and thinking about, you know, his shoes and what you just shared, putting myself in your shoes as the investor, uh, that's certainly what he was was filtering for. And uh, you're right, absolutely. Like for raising money, for bringing in teams, for anything, showing that that willingness to get to get your hands dirty. I mean, that's the classic startup founder ethos, right? That you that you probably are looking for. So kudos to you and, and also, yeah, to Sam Rosen for, for, uh, for looking for that. And yeah, that's cool. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. I mean, at the early days, really, it's about the process, not the product. You could show me the coolest looking car ever, but at the early days, I, I'm almost guaranteeing it's not going to end up being that car that hits the road. It's probably something else. And so show me the way you got to building that, you know, prototype uh, is more important uh, than the actual final product, which is, you know, I think the, what we're both saying. So, you know, to transition to what you're working on today, you know, I know that you have spent a ton of time living in San Francisco and then moved out of the city uh, only a couple of years ago. But can you give our audience sort of a transition of how you started off living in San Francisco? You moved on to uh, a seven acre farm and in between, I believe, uh, slept on a boat for, for several months. But, you know, tell us about your transition, you know, into and out of San Francisco uh, and onto the farm life uh, over the last few years and how you got there. Yeah, sure. So, um, uh, like I said, our first startup turnstile was, uh, was acquired by Yelp in 2017. And, uh, part of that, that transaction was, um, was, was me and a lot of the team actually moving to San Francisco where Yelp's headquartered to, uh, to do the integration. Yeah. I have, I have to say like, that was just an absolute blessing. Just so lucky to go down and do that. Cause you know, we were in the heart of kind of Silicon Valley working with Jeremy, uh, who's just a fantastic founder CEO and, uh, really, we're we're able to learn a lot about about the the the, uh, the heart of startup startup uh, the startup community and, and the tech community. So that was really inspiring. It definitely like made me know I wanted to stay here. I uh, wanted to stay in California and and get closer to this community and, and continue to build my next business in this uh, region. But uh, you know, I think what started to happen is like I don't know if you've been here many times. You know, the surrounding area of San Francisco is just gorgeous. There is just so much wonderful nature, and I kept catching myself getting drawn out into you know the wine country and the coast. Um, and I was spending so much time out there that I was just like, when it came to uh, when I made the decision, like I'm definitely just moving here and I want to start my next company here. It was like, do I want to live in San Francisco or, or do I want to kind of buy a house where I'm spending most of my time, which out, out in the country. And, uh, I just looked around. I mean, I looked at the budgets and I realized what you can get for, for, uh, 
not you don't get very much in San Francisco for for the for versus if you this is 2019 if you kind of took that same budget and p- applied it out where I live up in Occidental about I don't know 80 miles north 70 miles north uh, you get you get a much bigger place like you said you get friggin' all this land and a big old house it's it's all old but yeah hell if you, if that's what you're into if you're into nature it was just a great choice so. I was looking around and kind of fighting and my lease had come to expired and I just decided like, well, I'm not going to pull the trigger just because I need a place to live. So I just moved out onto a little boat out in Sausalito, lived there for like four months and, uh, and then decided like, yeah, I'm going to buy, buy a place in the country. Let's, uh, let's see what happens. This was pre COVID too, before remote work. So I actually figured I was kind of, kind of doomed. I didn't really know what I was going to do. Cause like, can't really commute two hours there to and from work. Um, we were still doing office work at the time. So I just stayed living on that boat thinking like, maybe I could just live on this boat. Uh, and then bam, COVID hit and just kind of rescued me. It, it just basically made all of our work go remote. And, uh, I was able to just move up here full time and just start immersing myself in, in my little, uh, wine country community, which, which I'll stop there. Cause I mean, that was the the um, motivation and inspiration for what what became our next startup here, Lumo. Well, I mean, first off, kudos to you for having the courage to just say, you know, fuck San Francisco. I need to be in nature and have a little bit of like work life balance before COVID and all that remote stuff was happening. And also just the willingness to say, you know what, the trade off is I'll live on a boat even during the winters in San Francisco, you know, with a little base heater and commute in on Mondays and go back on, you know, Thursdays and, and spend you know the weekends, long weekends at the farm. A lot of people would not have made that trade off before COVID, but your timing four or five months later was absolutely perfect. And you were able to move out to the farm full time, as you said, and work there and spend a lot of time out there um, before prices obviously skyrocketed and everyone was looking to buy land all around the world. So, you know, I got to ask, you know, during COVID, you had some time to yourself and think about it. What were you doing with all that free time on your hands? And kind of tell us how you started getting interested in farming and sustainable growing and, and eventually water conservation. Yeah, free time's funny. I, I ended up getting married and also having a baby during COVID. So uh, free time wasn't wasn't as plentiful, but uh but definitely like being more on the homestead, I guess, out on you know, seven acres out, out here in the country. Um you start to just need hobbies right it's not like you can just finish work and be like all right i'm gonna pop into town and grab beers or whatever like we live in a town of a thousand people it's like a tiny little tiny little town so uh you start you start you know looking to your neighbors and being inspired by what they do i have this fantastic next door neighbor uh who is literally like a wizard at at orcharding and she you know i'd go up to her place she's got this amazing two acre orchard it's just like so dialed in and she's right you know got chickens and she's just building this really wonderful life and, uh, and I started to think like, man, that's, that's, uh, that's the sort of thing that if I, I live up here, I want to be able to build for my home and for my family. And, and also, yeah, I have neighbors that are vineyard owners and, and wineries and you're, you're kind of seeing what they do on a day-to-day basis. And you're like, these are really amazing hobbies. And they're, they're building not only like beautiful property and cultivating the land, but they're, they're building resilience for their families and for themselves, right? Like having their own food supply and, uh, and so on. So, um, yeah, I took that on as a hobby. Just started doing a lot more, um, you know, of, of that building orchards. And uh, obviously, the first thing you need once you plant seventy five trees or whatever I planted is wa- irrigation. I mean, these are you planting them from scratch, so they need a fair bit of um, attention. And and I have so many different types of trees, and they all have kind of a different um, profile for what sort of water they need. Um, I just quickly realized, like, man, this this watering thing, I didn't know what I had signed up for. Like this watering thing is, is real. Like you got to be out there often checking the plants, seeing which ones need water, which ones don't, and trying to kind of cater, cater the water profile for them. And, uh, yeah, when you're doing that and you do it manually, it becomes very challenging because you, you very, you know, you, you'll go out, you'll, you'll turn on the water for the citrus and then you'll turn on the water for the berries and you'll set a timer on your watch. Okay. I'm going to come back in an hour and turn it off and then you'll get busy and you'll forget. And all of a sudden six hours goes by, you know, you flood your field. I pretty quickly realized like, wow, there's, there is not a good set of tools for people trying to grow water, or at least it didn't seem like it, um, to or go grow food. Uh, to automate the watering of their plants. So I better try to try to find something in the market. And I just had the hardest time finding anything good that I could put in the field uh, that felt modern, that felt kind of like nest, right? Like uh, you were so used to 
automation in the rest of our lives. And I was just blown away to see there was not a lot of automation available for me uh, on the farm. So that's that that was the eye opener. And I yeah, I got started getting into it. Yeah, it's so funny. You, you you first you know move out to the country and you set up this farm, but really you don't have much on it. But then you start to immerse yourself in, in the community around there, and you realize, wow, these people actually have like one like a passion and a hobby and a lot of hard work that they've been building over years, and they're creating something that is way bigger than themselves and can sustain a lot more people than themselves. So you got the bug from that. But obviously, the startup and entrepreneurial bug that you have deep inside you just couldn't hide itself after leaving the valley. It always pokes its head out. And you came up with the idea of, you know, how can I build a startup to solve this water crisis or this climate change crisis that everyone talks about every day, but you really didn't think about it until you, you know, felt it face to face with, you know, your own farming problem. So tell us a little bit how you started thinking about like, you know, climate change and water conservation exactly. And why did you think that this was something you could actually do yourself? Or did you think you needed someone else to help you build it for you? Great question. And, and, uh, a good way to put it, like, you know, I think when it really became more than just like a hobby, cause I mean, I was building this orchard and, and it was kind of just for me at the time. Um, and obviously I kind of told you I had these water issues and I, you know, drained my well out and, you know, I'd done all that, but it all still felt pretty much just personal. And like, uh, like you said, your, your entrepreneurial instinct kicks in and you think, let me go see if I can build a better board for myself, something to control this water. And, I went away and learned Arduino and I built this little kind of device to, to manage my water for me using a little mobile app and, and it all worked really well. Um, but at the time I thought like, haha, this is just a hobby, you know, something I'm working on at night, something I'm working on the weekends. But it wasn't until kind of the summer when, like I said, I drained my well out and then my neighbor's wells were also starting to run out that I started to realize like, yo, this, this water shortage thing is, uh, is, is a big problem. It's not just, it's so easy to just sit in a city, you know, like San Francisco where your taps are always on and hear about what's happening down the street and in your, you know, farm country all around you and, and, uh, and think, Oh yeah, that sounds really bad. But then, you know, you still go have your shower that night. Like when my water runs out on the groundwater, uh, well, there is no shower. There's no flushing the toilets. There's none of that. You have to call someone who will like ship you water in a truck. It takes three weeks to get to you because it's so backlogged. So what are you going to do for three weeks? I mean, I was going down to the to town, buying five gallon jugs of water for $5 a pop, pouring them in the back of my toilet and flushing them. And man, when you realize like the cost and the challenge to your life, when you start to run out of water in your, not only your house, but in your local community, when all those people are, you know, you meet up for drinks that night and everyone's talking about the challenge that they're having. That's when it started to feel like, wow, this water shortage thing needs entrepreneurs to give a shit and to try to build something for it. And luckily for me, I had been working on this, you know, in the forefront of it without even knowing it at the time, but Eric, sorry, my dogs are crazy. Someone's coming down the line. Irrigation is by far the biggest user of water. It's 70% or more in California. Some estimates are that it's as high as 80% of all the water used in the state is uh, for irrigating crops. And uh, like I said, I was sitting there irrigating my crops. My neighbors were irrigating their crops. And I was like, man, I might be sitting on like an actual business here that could be really meaningful to solving this water shortage issue. Like if water is being used in irrigation and I'm trying to on the side work on a system that will help irrigators be as efficient as they possibly can be with using their water, tracking the use of that water, you know, trying their best to, to monitor and measure it. Maybe I could take that around to my neighbors and to the farm community near me and see if they already have solutions. And maybe I've you know built something that is is redundant. Um, but if I haven't, maybe I'm working on something really meaningful for making a dent in, in some of the you know water water use uh, and water efficiency issues that we, that we have. So I just kind of took it around to my community and I asked every grower I could find, like, how are you irrigating your crops? You know, you have 50 acres or a hundred acres. You must be doing something more effective than manually going around and turning knobs on and off. Like I was, you know, what are you using? And I was blown away. Like 90 plus percent of the growers I spoke with were like, Nope, I'm still trying to do it manually. And I still have not found, a uh, solution that is reliable and easy to use that can uh, empower me to both automatically irrigate, but also, you know, know how much I'm irrigating and be precise about how much I'm irrigating. And that really blew me away. Like, okay, holy, we, we, you know, 
if they're the biggest users of water and they feel underserved with technology, uh, we have to do something better. You know, our tech entrepreneurs have to come together and, and start putting their mind into this to try and help our farmers who, by the way, have like the most have the biggest hearts and the biggest concerns for for the environment. I mean, they live in it every day. They are not trying to ever be wasteful. Um, if they have the tools, they are going to be stewards of the environment because that is exactly what they do. That is their instinct. Um, so it was more like, wow, okay, let's see if we can build these tools and and get them into their hands. And that that kind of led to led to where we are today with Lumo. That's incredible. I mean, I can't imagine people were sitting around the coffee shop complaining about their Wi-Fi connection in your last startup. Like they are complaining about the fact they can't flush their toilets and costing them thousands of dollars just to, you know, feed their crops and their family. Uh, I mean, what a what an inspiring sort of experience to get you off your ass and try to build something for people. But I mean, you know, we all know that climate change is real and we know the the scarcity of water and how it impacts everything from, you know, our food crops to supply chains and everything, you know, are you telling me that people who are in the sort of middle to upper agricultural space are still manually trying to control their irrigation systems? Yeah. Oh yeah. Tons. I mean, it, it changes by crop, right? And there's a, you know, there's so many different ways of irrigating and there's so many different types of crops that it's impossible to blanket to make a statement about, you know, the state of irrigation technology, you know, for, for, for agriculture in general, but, you know, looking at specialty crops, the ones that are, you know, two, two, 2.9 million acres of kind of drip irrigated specialty crop out here in California, um, for sure, largest, like a mass majority of it is still hand crank valves, uh, you know, with very little, system of record about where water is going, uh, meaning like analog one, maybe they have one analog flow meter on their well that tells them how much water has come out so they can uh, report that to the state at the end of a year. But when it comes, you know, other than that, yeah, manual turning on and off valves is a very, very common, most common way to irrigate. And uh, very little, very few have any sense of how much water is going to which blocks. Yeah, it's basically like our energy meters or our water meters on our homes reporting it to, you know, the local uh, suppliers on how much we consume and then they send us a bill for that. But there's no actual Nest thermostat or Ecobee that's, you know, trying to throttle and conserve and be energy efficient with uh, with our energy or consumption as well. So tell us, like, how did you think software uh, and combined with hardware could actually support this in the agriculture space? And how did you go about building the first prototypes uh, and eventually get them tested? Yeah, our, our first inspiration was looking at companies like Meraki or like Nest that had done a really good job taking legacy infrastructure and bringing it, you know, to to the Internet of Things world, uh, applying Internet of Things to it. So we we went out and looked at these, you know, what, what is the state of the union for farmers when they irrigate? And like I said, there there, there actually are controllers out there. There you, you'll see in the residential space, for example, lots of controllers that will be um you know can help you schedule and run your 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 irrigation for your lawn or for your garden so we were able to look at some of the technology that existed and the biggest challenge is though and the reason why farmers aren't adopting those technologies is there a lot of them are really they have to be hardwired to power in order to operate a lot of them have to be hardwired to valves themselves in order to be able to actuate them and turn them on and off if you want to track any water flow again you have to have like a flow meter connected to a wire that's run you know into one of these controllers and we just started to ask farmers like you know well, this doesn't seem like it's going to work for you and it is never going to work for a farmer to have everything wired like that, right? Like they, they have hundreds, if not thousands of acres across thousands of valves, dumping huge amounts of water. There's not a good way to imagine a controller, uh, an irrigation controller um, being hardwired and, and having like Wi-Fi. It's just not going to happen. If you want to really help put, uh, you know, a farmer automate some of the valve uh, and, and water monitoring that they're doing, in their fields, you're going to have to be able to build um, a new way of communicating and, and a new way of powering. So we we kind of first looked at those solutions or at that, that problem set and built our prototype to be a valve controller that was connected to the cloud um, through cellular or over you know long range uh, Bluetooth or Wi-Fi meshing, and uh, and then we built into it a rechargeable battery that had a long life as well as some solar power and um that that gave us our first prototype controller that runs um my orchard 
totally off the grid and uh and it worked really well it's been you know very reliable for me it it's run for two seasons now never had any downtime the solar is more than enough to recharge it after just a few hours of sunlight battery lasts for many 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 days now um and we were also able to start innovating on some of the communication protocol uh where we now have we can actually add you know valves in you know throughout a field and so long as they're within range of one another, they're going to be able to mesh and hop off one another so that only one of them ever really needs to be connected to the internet. The rest of them can all stay connected to the internet by communicating back to the one uh, internet connected valve. So that was what, once we built that prototype out, we felt really confident that actually we have a chance here to, um, as long as we can, you know, make sure there's enough valves in the field or enough relay points in the field, we, we, we feel really confident we can cover a many acre field uh, with automated valves that are connected back to the cloud so that a farmer is empowered to control those valves and monitor the water and their health uh, all from, from the comfort of his home or, his, uh, or her home uh, or vacation. And that's, uh, that's where we got. And um, that really inspired us to say like, okay, you know what? That's one of the biggest problems that we've seen. Like if we can solve that and give it a beautiful, easy to manage uh, user interface, like what, like I said, Nest and Meraki have done, uh, I think we're really going to be able to, to, to do something to make a dent in, in um, farmers being able to, to be more precise with when they water and how much they water. So we went, and, uh, went ahead and took that from prototype and started, uh, started fundraising to build, build the real deal. That's amazing. I mean, I remember seeing the first prototype at your farm and it was like this raspberry Pi and some like, you know, uh, archaic little uh, 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 waterproof box uh, sitting out there duct taped together, you know, but you, again, it kind of comes back to the time when you even started Turnstile, like you went out, built a prototype, found some overseas uh, engineers to help build the first little thing and get it going. It's unbelievable, right? It, I mean, people can't see this thing, but it's it literally, it looks like absolute, like maybe a homemade bomb device or something. I don't know, but it's amazing that you did that and got it live work in the field. But I think what the most impressive thing was that you still did not stop the iteration of the uh, of the far, uh, the customer journey. You know, you kept going back and saying, what is it you're doing? What do you want? What do you need? What do you not need? What is too much? What is this industry trying to sell you that you just don't want? And you were like, oh, great. You don't want something that has to connect to power. You don't want something that's hardwired, blah, 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 blah. And you started building that. The funniest thing is that your Wi-Fi background and mesh Wi-Fi background from Turnstile days has applied itself to your new hardware startup again in the agriculture space. So do the do the valves need to be all Wi-Fi connected as well? Or how do the individual valves who are probably not Lumo products connect to the main uh, internet source? Yeah, well, actually, the way the way it works is uh, a lot of valves out there can be turned on and off using um, electricity. Uh, the problem is more how do you get electricity out to them? And even if you get electricity out to them, how do you control that electricity to be turning on and off when when you need it? So what's been really good is we can kind of we've built we've built a retrofit device that it doesn't need to be connected to Wi-Fi. It can connect to any other valve out in the field so it can hop off valve after valve off a valve uh, all the way back to our kind of base station or you know any any valve that we have that can get connected to the internet and for in order to do that you you could connect the valve to uh wi-fi say at the at the at the farmer's house uh, or you could just add a, a um a cellular modem, right, to, to one of these one of these valves and get it connected. So, um, really, only one valve needs its own internet source, and then the rest of the valves out in the field are all hopping off one another to, to stay connected. That's a big part of like what allows us to scale that, um, yeah, valve network. Wow, that's brilliant. I mean, again, not being a hardware uh, uh, founder or technical founder, you've been able to figure out and navigate this. But I know there's a sidekick here, or a couple sidekicks. So can you tell us about how you found your co-founder and your founding team and how you convinced them to believe in this crazy mission? The the first the first person was the technical co-founder, John, CTO, John Hinnigan. Um, and we knew each other for a long time, more than a decade. Uh, never worked together, but he's an entrepreneur and has a really, really wonderful track record as a senior uh, engineering leader at Google and Amazon. And yeah, he actually kind of reached out to me saying, hey, I'm starting to think about a, you know starting a new company. Or are you you know in the same headspace? Because I'd love to find a partner uh, on the more of the go-to-market strategy side. And that, that was where I fit. So we were, we started chatting and I told him, you know, I've been working on this thing and I don't know if it'll ever be a business at that, at that time. This is probably like 2021. I was kind of like, wasn't even sure if it would ever really be a business, but he, he was really kind of the powerhouse in motivating us 
because first he was very challenging. Like, why would that ever be a good idea? There must be someone else out there doing it. And he really pushed me to look harder at what was out there in terms of competition and to do that customer discovery that you mentioned of just continually asking and trying to disprove my own hypothesis um, about, you know, whether or not people felt this was an area that they needed more support. He was great. He, he pushed me and pushed me until finally he flew out one weekend and went to visit the farms I'd been meeting with. And at the end of that weekend, he came, came to me and was like, okay, I see what you're seeing here. This is really a need. Uh, there is nothing out there for these farmers. And yet like, you know, the vision of, of water conservation is real and we need to do more. And I think this can make a dent. So he was really inspiring. And um, to have his support as like a really, really hot, you know, strong software engineer, that was that was helpful. Because I mean, a big, big part of what's going to make a product like ours adoptable and, and widely adopted is the, so the software, right? It needs to be easy to use. It needs to feel modern. Um, the, you know, it cannot feel like a difficult thing to set these valves up, to monitor these valves, to, to understand the health of them and so on. It has to feel really easy to use. So he's bringing that to the table. Um, and then him and I sat down, I guess, after we decided in, at the start of the, this new year that we were going to do this business, we said to ourselves, you know, we still have some gaps though. We have, uh, we've never built a valve. We never built hardware. And we luckily just randomly again maybe this is manifested or maybe it's luck we were introduced to the the founding team from a company called flow we, we had a, a vc meeting trying to talk you know talk about raising money and one of the vcs that we spoke with was like you know what i don't know you guys don't seem to have like a good background in hardware why don't i but i i invested in this company they were called flow they sound kind of exactly like what you're trying to build they built a smart uh, valve and flow meter for the residential landscape uh and they're really successful and they sold it to moen and i want them to kick the tires on you i want to see if you're any good and uh i got an introduction to a, a fellow named henry halimi and his son gabe halimi and um Man, they, they definitely kicked our tires and they definitely beat us up. But over, you know, talking with them and working with them and sharing the vision and sharing our challenges and being humble about kind of the gaps we had on the hardware side, Henry and, and uh, was more and more like, hey, you know what? I've I've done this before. I've built a smart valve with embedded flow meter that can, you know, help a homeowner better manage their water use and track their efficiency and, and protect them in the case of leaks like that's the value prop you're going for. And I know how to get it done. You know, would you be open to, you know, bringing, bringing me on as a partner and, and, uh, and building this together. And I was like, just so humbled. Right. I mean, to what a wonderful partner to, to be introduced to. Uh, so yeah, we brought him on as an equal partner. And so, you know, founding team is me, um, John and, and Henry, and we, we feel really, really good about that complementary skill set. Um, to go get this thing, to go get this thing built. Um, because Henry lets us, you know, Henry lets us move from just building the, you know, a little bit of hardware that controls a valve on and off to actually building a valve, a, a, a self-sufficient valve with embedded flow meter, everything in it, as opposed to having to kind of be a aftermarket product on the, on the, on the legacy valves that are out there. So we're really feeling good about that addition. And, uh, and that's the team now going forward. That's amazing. I mean, I think one, uh, your experience as a uh, now a second time founder, it makes you really be honest with yourself uh, about your own mistakes and your own gaps and your own skill sets and want to fill those right off the bat, rather than maybe some first time founders who think they can do it all, which, you know, being a fundraiser, uh, a salesperson and uh, a, a product builder all in one just never has existed before. But obviously, you've gone through that journey before and realized, I know what I know and I know what I'm good at. Now, let me go give up a third of the company to two other people that can do it 10 times better than I can so we can move 10 times faster uh, and not make the same mistakes you made last time, right? You just nailed it. It's it's speed, right? It's, it's speed is the name of the game. And there's no right answer to that. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who would argue that control is the name of the game and other other elements of, of, of company maybe making money is the name of the game. Uh I don't know. The way I look at it is it's, it's about speed to market. And if you try to do everything on your own, there's a really good chance that not only will you be slowed down by, you know, changing your, your focus all the time. Um, but you're exposing yourself to huge, huge, uh, mistake risk, uh, you know, just, just having to relearn a wheel that someone else already knows. So if you can find people that know, uh, well, first off, like you said, be humble, like ask yourself, the first thing you should ask yourself is not why I can do this. It's, 
why can't I do this? And, and who might I need to bring along with me to achieve my vision? And then the second thing is like finding those people and making sure that they have that uh, right cultural fit. Because if they do, if they have that cultural fit, they share your vision and they have those complementary skill sets, you are going to be able to move 10 times faster and build a company that's more valuable that even if you have less of a share of in the long run, it's going to be worth a lot more to not only to yourself um, financially, but by actually making it see the light of day and achieve your vision, you're going to make a big, bigger impact in the world. And so you really want you really want to be thoughtful about early partnerships, I think, and be generous early on to make sure that those things work out. Yeah, absolutely. Great advice for all the first time founders out there. Now, tell us about the fundraising round that you just announced and how it all came together. Yeah, so we're we're closing up uh, our fundraising uh, right now. Actually, just just this week, um, so we have um, raised two million dollars to to get the business uh, started off the ground. Um, you know, advance our prototype and then take take what we can to market or take what we build to market. Uh, we we round is led by Fall Line Capital, which is an amazing group of uh, of of farmland owners and and venture capital ag tech investors they literally couldn't be a better partner for us they I mean, it's impossible to find a vc who not only knows tech and and, and ag tech but also uh, owns you know a ton of farmland in america so has real hands on experience with the problems that we're trying to solve and a huge network of growers that they could be introducing us to to um, to accelerate our product customer discovery as well as our, our kind of product development. So uh, they they came in, uh, led the round, and then we just really went back to uh, a lot of the people that had helped us in Turnstile days. As you as you know, we had a huge cap table at Turnstile, maybe like fifty one angels or something on it, and. Uh, I think we probably, yeah, we, we probably have somewhere similar in terms of the number of angels uh, this time around because we were able to reach out to a lot of those those people between John and I and uh, and just share the vision and share that we were going to go back into the market and try to do something um, again. And not only have we had that past success to lean on, where I think it helps because they they see that we've uh, made the money once before, so maybe we could do it again. But um, more importantly, I think. We, we have a really good network of people that care a lot about climate change, care a lot about um, the environment and, and water is becoming more and more of a concern for people um, and that they want to invest in to try to try to make a, a difference. Um, and so, yeah, when we were able to share that not only are we back out there trying to build a new business, but we're trying to build a business that's going to address one of the biggest issues in climate and environmental change, uh, they were really eager to get on board. So, yeah, between all those angels and, and fall line, we've, we've closed the round up and uh, we're out there about to build. No, that's amazing. I mean, your timing couldn't be more perfect with what's going on in the Ukraine and supply change and climate change. There's obviously a lot of things meeting together for why this is the right time to build a company like Lumo. So can you share with us what the long-term vision is? And, you know, I don't know how many farmers we have as listeners out there, but can you tell how people can get in touch with you if they want to test out the system and learn more about the company? Yeah, sure, sure. Well, yeah, the, the big the big vision is really anchored around we, we want to make a big difference uh, and, and massively improve the efficiency of fresh water use for humanity. And I know we've talked a lot about, I mean, irrigation is the number one area to focus on because it is such a big user of, of, uh, of, of fresh water. So if we can be more efficient with irrigation, we're going to make a big dent in, in improving water um, conservation. And uh, But I know we've talked a lot about our, our first product, which is the valve. Um, and that, that certainly plays a big role in what we're building, the smart valve to help empower um, growers to be more efficient with their water uh, and to and to be able to be more precise with where and when they use it. But that's not kind of the end game for us. We, we kind of look at, we ask a lot of questions from farmers about like, how could you be more efficient with water? And um, a lot of them share that, you know, because they, they don't actually have a good way to measure the water that they're using, um, they don't really have a good way to get 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 uh, their water rights out into the into digital record and, and use those as a way to kind of trade or, or you know be more efficient with uh, with how they use with how they use any surpluses they have or if they do want to go over their water rights allotments like how do they go find water rights that are available to them so they can so they can continue to to, to irrigate and um, what we're thinking is it'd be really nice if we can actually become the largest system of record for fresh water use. 
uh, in the world. So uh, our valves are not only smart valves that can be turned on and off remotely. They have a, a very um, sensitive flow meter in them that can be very precise about how much water is being used when and where. And we digitize that record. Uh, and we allow farmers to use that digital record, obviously, uh, for their own operations, right? So importing it into their farm management software. But we also allow them to use it to upload to the state um, to kind of prove out water right usage. Uh, and we're hoping that in the long run, if we have enough farmers using these valves, uh, we'll actually become a huge system of record to allow farmers to connect with one another and potentially even trade any surpluses that they have uh, or sell surpluses that they have um, to create a more efficient uh, water trading market. Um, because we do believe that one of the big solutions that's going to help farmers become you know, optimal with how they use water, when and where, on which crops, uh, is by creating a more uh, robust market for fresh water uh, and irrigation water. Markets tend to be magical ways. Uh, markets and prices tend to be very magical and powerful ways of uh, optimizing allocations. And uh, right now, the, the water market in California, for example, might trade one or two percent of all the um, you know fresh water that gets used in the state. And uh, I think if we could empower farmers to have more data and to make it a lot easier and uh, easier and more transparent for them to to see. Uh, how much they're using and how much their neighbors are using, we could actually connect them and create a really robust marketplace. So that, that's one of the areas that we're trying to keep in top of our mind as we develop our device and as we kind of build our network of, 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 um, of irrigators using our system. Wow, that's amazing to be able to have that much data to be able to contribute to the, uh, I believe it's called the Aqua OSO commodities uh, market that's traded on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange for uh, future um, water rights or entitlements is an incredible feature that I didn't even think about until you just mentioned it right now. So that's really exciting. You know, before we wrap things up, we always love to ask our guests for their fast favorites. You had them on the last time. Hopefully you have some new ones for us before we finish things off. So first and foremost, favorite podcast and please don't say this one my favorite podcast hands down is my climate journey uh they are just a wonderful group uh, bringing together a community of passionate uh people whether it's just you know people with a passion about climate whether it's entrepreneurs whether it's investors um or uh want to you know employees working on climate uh, they've just built the best community out there um concerned about the climate and and working together to to uh, find solutions for improving improving the our, our, uh, our environment and our climate uh, solving our climate challenges. So um, my climate journey is just my favorite. They're so so good. You really should check them out. Oh yeah, check that one out. That's yeah. awesome. Uh, next, your favorite newsletter or blog? Wine Industry Advisor is awesome. They uh, our first market that we're focused on is wine um, because it's just such a big industry out where I live. You know, it's just such a and 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 you know they they do use a lot of water and they're really efficient. Uh, or they're a really profitable crop. Um, so we, we really are focused on them. And I, I just think that newsletter does such a good job at, in a flash, capturing what's going on in the industry. And they really do invest a lot of their space to talk about the water challenges that they're having and uh, how, how other people how other people solve it. And then, you know, Irrigation Today, I would say, is my next, my next favorite because they are just as you can imagine, everything I need to know about irrigation. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you're surrounded by some of the best wineries and vineyards in the world. So I'm, I can't imagine that you're not a part of the, the wine industry advisory panel one day. So thanks for sharing that. Your next is a favorite tech gadget. Oh, that's the Arduino. Man, what a winner. I've uh, So obviously the Arduino board was what I used to uh, build a prototype for my for, for, for the what Lumo has become. Um, but uh, now that I know a little bit about it, I'm able to build so many little hardware solutions for everything around me. I've built myself a uh, lights timer for my hot tub. So if I'm like walking over to the hot tub at night, I, it can like, I, I built a little device that will detect me, turn on the lights. Uh, it'll check to see if it's too sunny because if it is, it won't turn on the lights. Uh, it's really awesome and so much fun to work on Arduino. And uh, yeah, learn, learn Arduino and you'll just have, you'll never stop building on it. It's so much fun. So is it like a Raspberry Pi or it's more programmable? Yeah, yeah. It's like ras it's like Raspberry Pi. But it, is idea. it made like for like seven or eight year olds or like No, I mean go look it up online. They have an incredibly robust community of people building very powerful tool, uh very powerful products uh with Arduino as a backbone. It's just uh it's just, you know, a really powerful board that uh, it comes pretty much plug and play, um, so that you can get coding and building on it. And yeah, what a, what a, what an amazing product. I they, they they're my favorite. That's awesome. I got to check that out. Uh, favorite new trend? Oh, uh, 
What did I, what did I put down for that? Substack and direct content monetization. Oh, Substack, of course. Uh, well, and, and I mean, you're doing it, right? Like with what you do here with Tank Talks, you're, you've seen what has happened in, with the direct, uh, to, you know, um, creator to consumer relationship. The, you know, 10 years ago, you wouldn't have been able to make Tank Talks the way you've made it today. So the, I love the trend of creators just getting direct to their, their consumers without the middleman. I think the middleman has become so inflated and, you know, we're seeing a lot happening, um, you know, with censorship and with, with, you know, other challenges that I think are really potentially harmful for, for free speech and, and, and for creators looking to just kind of go out there and and challenge and, and try new things. And I love what Substack has done to really empower, um, content creators to build their own audience and to go direct to the source and, um, kudos to them because their growth has been incredible. And, and, I've just anything like them that's out there, this whole kind of direct to consumer. This has been, this is amazing. I love that trend and I'm, I'm glad it's happening. Yeah. I mean, we would not be able to build up this podcast platform like we have without something like Substack and then all the peripheral third party apps that go around to support it, you know, like our riverside.fm for recording. And, you know, my wife, Jess, just released her, her first kid's book, you know, Get Outside, oh, which, I bought. which you bought, which I bought. It's amazing. I mean, just the thinking of like her taking an idea to getting an illustrator on Upwork. And then creating a website that I built to be able to distribute this thing around the world through, you know, Kindle publishing with Amazon. All of that is direct to consumer, no middlemen really besides some of the publishing manufacturers. Besides that, it's it's amazing trend. It is amazing. It is amazing. Yeah. Uh, next one, favorite book. I know you like to read a lot. Um, I have two good ones, but I'll, I'll tell you that my number one favorite right now is The Water Paradox uh, by Edward Barbier. Um, He's he's done a great job in a very succinct, uh, easy to read book uh, sharing. It's called The Water Paradox, Why There Will Never Be Enough Water and How to Avoid the Coming Crisis. And he's he's really gone on to explain what has changed now versus in the past. Uh, about water and why now is a bit of a tipping point for us finding a new way um, to change from being all about finding new water and drilling deeper and, and being, you know, you know, being greedy without how, where do we find new sources? He's really talked a lot about how like we have to change that mindset to being more efficient with the sources that we have. Um, and man, he does such a good job covering uh, both the developed and developing world, some of the challenges that we have had with with uh, managing water, but also like the upsides that are available to us uh, when it comes to building new innovations, when it comes to building water markets, uh, when it comes to government policy and to entrepreneurial um, energy. He's just nailed it. And it's very easy read. I, I love reading it. Um, I recommend it to anyone interested in water. Uh, and the other one, if you're interested in California water specifically, is called The Dreamt Land uh, by a very, very prolific writer, Mark Arax. Uh, and it, it's just such a fun read. And man, do you get an appreciation for the entrepreneurial spirit that California brings, but also the challenge that that entrepreneurial spirit continues to put on our water resources. And uh, I'm hoping to, to kind of uh, cha- channel that entrepreneurial spirit, but toward more efficient water use, uh, as opposed to just like more, uh, appropriate of water use. Those are two great ones. I got to check that out. By the way, I can't believe I forgot to mention this, but you know, we live in Ontario, Canada, where you're from, and you know that this is the land of many lakes. So we have a ton of fresh water here, but it's still on top of my mind all the time. And so for this year, I decided for our little garden at home, instead of wasting water and setting up a sprinkler system, I bought a, a small little irrigation system on Amazon uh, and built up a timer on side of it and spread it out across our garden around the, the house. And now everything's set up on a six hour timer uh, for our garden this year and it's flourishing. Well done. Well done. Look at that. You improved your crop crop quality using less water. That's the value prop for Lumo as well. So you nailed you it. You inspired me when I came out to the farm. So thank you. And last but not least, favorite life lesson. Uh, you know, I think on the last one, I shared the idea of kind of being generous with equity. So I won't even talk about that. I'm going to talk about a new one I've learned from my wife, Molly uh, Hayward, uh, about just following your heart um, and following your passion. Um, because if you do, you, you know, you, you really will manifest success for yourself. And uh, yeah, whether it's luck or whether it's, you know, the universe kind of seeing you following your heart and, and delivering you, uh, you know, partnerships and other things to help you with your success. She was totally right. You know, with Lumo, I was, I was spooked to start a new business. It'd been five years, you know, I was very afraid that my uh, entrepreneurial bones had 
atrophied and that I wasn't gonna be able to get back on the horse. But she, uh, she saw me sitting at the table late nights working on this thing. She's like, I haven't seen you this passionate in a long time. Um, you know, what are you doubtful about? And I was like, look, I'm just really like afraid to kind of get back on the horse. I don't know if I still have it. I don't want to fail. And she's like, you know, if you follow your heart and you do what you care most about, your passion is your biggest asset. And it is going to influence the universe. It's going to influence other people. Um, and it's going to shine through and it's going to, you know, it's not, doesn't guarantee you success uh, in any financial sense, but it guarantees you success in, in being happy because you're going to be working every day on what you love. So, well, you know, I definitely don't believe it was luck that brought us together. It was probably manifested, but uh, I'm so happy to see that you're doing it back again for round two and building Lumo. Uh, and I'm so happy that Molly, the smartest person that you've ever met in your life, decided to push your ass forward to build this thing for a second time. Because remember the first time you said to me, I have nothing to lose and everything to gain by going forward on this journey. Yeah. So hopefully that mentality still exists with you today, even with a wife and kids. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us in the tank today with Devin Wright, co-founder and CEO of Lumo. Thank you so much for having me, Maddie. Thanks for listening to another episode of Tank Talks. To learn more about this episode, be sure to go to Apple Podcast or Spotify to find more detailed notes on this episode or to check out previous episodes. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review and a rating as it helps us out a lot. And hit that subscribe button so you can get notified when new episodes come out. Finally, make sure to give me a follow on Twitter at Maddie B. Cohen or at Tank Talk Podcast to stay up to date on new episodes or to be a guest on our show. Till next time, 